Hi everyone. Hello. I'm Curran. I'm going to present today about Angular JS. So all the content I'll be presenting is available here at this URL. Uh, I'm going to spend maybe five or ten minutes on the background of Angular. What is it? What's it for? And then go through 50 code examples that introduce various Angular concepts bit by bit. So here's that URL. So what is AngularJS? So if you go to the, the home page of Angular, this is what it looks like. It says HTML enhanced for web apps. So Angular is a, it's kind of a futuristic framework for web application development. It implements now the concepts behind new standards of HTML called web components and model driven views. So it was created by this guy, Mis Mishko Hevry, in 2009. Uh, and there's a huge community of users behind it. And it's, it's gaining a lot of traction in, in, in industry. So Angular is in a class of frameworks called data binding frameworks. So the whole purpose of data binding frameworks is to help with creating single page applications. I mean, they're more of general purpose, but this is the main use for them, is creating single page apps. So a single page application, I think this links to the Wikipedia page, um, I'd recommend reading about what it is. It's, it's using Ajax to fetch data without reloading the page. And it's like a thick client where it's a single HTML page that loads. And then as you navigate through the page, only the part of the URL after the hash changes. So if you put a hash in the URL and have some stuff after it, and you change the part that's after the hash, that can cause behavior in that page, but it doesn't cause the page to reload. So this is how it also hooks in with the back and forward buttons. You know, because if you, if you click back, and the only thing that changes is the part after the hash, the page doesn't reload, but it might cause the page to change the view to what it was before. A lot of these data binding frameworks are based on the model view controller concept, which is an old concept in computer science, and it's, it's really uh, still relevant today. So this is the main concept, that there's a model, which is the data behind the thing that you're, sh that you're looking at on the screen. That's like the data behind the app. But it's only the data. It's no behaviors, and it's no presentation logic or layout. It's just the data. And the view is the thing that the user sees. It's like the graphical presentation of the model. And then the user interacts with things on the screen. And all those interactions change the model through what's called a controller. The controller is a set of functions that you know just change the model and maybe they have some logic in the controllers about how to translate the user interactions to changes in the model. That's what the controller is all about. So all of these data binding frameworks today are based on this idea of model view controller. Data binding frameworks for single page applications, th there are three main things that they, they provide for you. One is routing, which means updating the page in response to changes in the URL but just the part, portion of the URL after the hash symbol. Templating, which means you can express your view in some what's called a templating language where there are parts of the view that will get replaced later with things from the model. And data binding. Data binding is what is really the, the newer part of this in, in web frameworks. And what that does, it, it maintains a synchronization between the model and the view, the user interface. So the top data binding frameworks today are Angular, Knockout, Ember. These are the top ones. And I've heard about these other ones too. And there are many, many, many more. Um, and it's kind of hard to tell like which one is the best, you know, but they all provide kind of overlapping functionality. Um, but I've heard just from conferences, at conferences and so on, that a lot of people prefer Angular as, you know, their favorite one. <clears throat> so, 
So all these data binding frameworks, in some way or other, build on these other libraries that existed before. So I just want to have you a little bit familiar with what these other libraries are. Um, underscore and Backbone, well, Underscore is a functional programming utility library. It brings functional programming primitives to JavaScript. Uh, primitives like map and reduce and a functional for loop, that sort of thing. Um, Lodash is the sort of modern, modern day replacement for underscore. They, they've added performance improvements and so on. Backbone was one of the first model view controller frameworks in JavaScript and it, it gained huge amounts of traction and a lot of people said, oh, Backbone provides things that should have been in JavaScript to begin with, like classes, the idea of classes and inheritance. Backbone helps with uh, routing and also uh, synchronization with a backend. But still, compared to the data binding frameworks, with Backbone, you need to do a lot of manual work. There's a lot of boilerplate for a whole web app uh, when you use Backbone. But that was kind of the predecessor to these data binding frameworks. And these frameworks, the, these, these libraries I'm about to talk about are sort of, they're, they're very influential to Angular. Angular contains little pieces of them in some way. So jQuery is like an industry standard DOM manipulation library. And Angular includes a jQuery-like API with their thing called uh, JQ Lite. Sometimes in Angular, it gives you access to a DOM element, but it's wrapped in this JQ Lite API, which is kind of like jQuery, but it's kind of like minimal uh, to reduce the size of the library. But you can do most things that you can do with jQuery with Angular's JQ Lite. Promises. <clears throat> so you probably run into this. When you write JavaScript that needs to do something like fetch data from a backend, your code becomes asynchronous and you need to start using callbacks. And the more asynchronous things that you have going on, the more complex the code gets. Um, and there have been many solutions to this over the past, but right now in industry, promises is like the way to deal with asynchronous code in JavaScript. So Q, this library by Chris Kowal, Q, is like the most prominent library for doing promises. So here, here's what it would look like without promises. You have this, this series of asynchronous calls and you need to indent the code more and more and more. But with promises, it sort of flattens it out with this method chaining kind of API. So promises are just something that are, that's good to be familiar with because you'll see them in all kinds of different contexts today. Angular includes a <clears throat> like a small version of Q in, as a, one of the core parts of its inner workings. Um, it's inspired by this other library, but it's a little bit different, but not much different. AMD. So asynchronous module definition lets you split JavaScript across many files and then declare in one file, okay, this file depends on these other files. And those other files in return can say, I depend on this other file. And this library called require.js will deal with loading them all in the proper order and then evaluating them only when their dependencies have also been evaluated. So this <coughs> AMD interface has inspired, in a way, Angular's dependency injection mechanism, which we'll see more of. Um, so it, pat it follows a similar pattern. In Angular, you can say, this thing depends on this other thing and then Angular's internal implementation will deal with loading things in the proper order. And lastly, Handlebars. Handlebars is a templating engine. So this is, this is a ver an example of a template where it's HTML, but in the HTML you have these <coughs> things that are inside double curly braces, and these get replaced with data values. So these are like variables that you can stick in the code so handlebars, what came before handlebars was mustache. That was one of the first templating libraries to use this syntax. Handlebars improved it. And Angular templates also use the syntax of handlebars.
Yeah. Yeah. Question. It's called mustache because of the curly braces. Is that I would it? guess so. <laughs> yeah. Mustache. This is their logo. It's a it's a it's a curly brace turned sideways, and it looks like a mustache. So that's that's what. <laughs> Any questions so far? So now I'm going to delve into the second part of the presentation, which deals with examples. So I have made 50 examples of Angular code that introduces various functionality of Angular. It's not comprehensive, but it covers a lot. And on the bottom of the page, I included this list of you know, web pages that I've used to learn all this stuff. Um, and so I'd, I'd encourage you later on, if you want to learn Angular, go through some of these things. These bird's eye view ones provide a bunch of links to other things and a suggested sequence of what you should do. And these other ones are kind of standalone uh, things. And the talks by the creator of Angular on YouTube are really amazing, really clear. He presents very clearly and he knows his stuff because he created it. So here we go with the examples. Um, I've made this little example viewer which is an Angular app too and hopefully by the end of this you'll be able to understand the code of this example viewer. Example 1. This is just a simple HTML page. There's no Angular at all. So it uses simple HTML language. It declares an input element which is this text box here. You can enter it in. So I have the example running on the top right, and then if you click this, the example runs full screen in a new tab. And this is available to you too. You can look at these examples on your machine. So it's just a hello world example. So example two, this is, so let's say that when I wanna, when I type text into this box, I want world to change to that text that I put in the box. It's like a greeter app. So we're going to make steps toward that. So this is a version of that that just uses the straight DOM API provided by all browsers. It's not using any libraries. And if I open up the, the console here, you can see that when I type, it, it outputs got key up event. So in the code it says, okay, grab that text input <coughs> element by its ID and then add the event listener to it that responds to the key up event. And then when you get that event, just output to the console, got key up event. So this is the straight, you know, vanilla JavaScript DOM API way of doing this. And then the next step is to just get the value, the text value, and print that out to the console. So now if I type, it says what the new text is. New text is blah, blah, blah. And so that, that API is just the, the, the element variable dot value that gets the text out of it. So the next step is I've put a span in next to hello to the right of it that's empty. Grab that also by its ID and then when the user adds something to that box, it grabs the text and then it sets the inner HTML of this span to be that text. So if I type uh, John, it says hello John. So this is the way to do it with straight JavaScript, no libraries, nothing. So the, the next example does the same thing using jQuery. So this is to just to illustrate how jQuery improved the basic uh, vanilla J JavaScript DOM API version. So all the elements are the same, but it just uses the jQuery API. So here's jQuery selectors to get that text box. Here's a clean jQuery syntax for adding event callbacks. And then it selects that name div, which is where the name will go. And then it calls the .html function, which replaces the inner HTML of that and then it grabs the value out of the text field. This is just to illustrate uh, what Backbone brought to the table as an improvement to jQuery. 
So it does the same thing. You know, hello, Tim. But here's what the code looks like. It's a model, a view, and a controller. The model is just a name. So when I type, then the name property of the model will change. So backbone models, you can think of them as just plain JavaScript objects that map keys to values. But they have this feature where you can listen for changes to properties on the object. And that's, that's the main thing that differentiates, differentiates a, a backbone model from a straight JavaScript object. So <clears throat> here's how you listen for changes. Model.on is the backbone API for adding listeners for, to the model change colon name. If I were to just add change to model, it would get this event for all changes. So that would work in this case, but I wanted to teach you also if you use colon name, it only listens for changes on the name property of this model. And this is the callback function, and then I'm using jQuery inside of here, setting the content of the name span, which is this over here, to be the value from the model. Now notice how here it's not, it, it could get, this code could get the, mod, the name from the text input, but the whole purpose of model view controller is to separate the view from the controller and from the model and have them all totally independent, uh, well not totally, but more loosely coupled than before. And this allows the complexity of the application to scale more easily. So here's the controller part. So it listens for the key up event on the text input. And then when the user enters some text, it just changes the model. See, it doesn't interact with the view. It only interacts with the view indirectly. So this is how the, the basic model view controller arrangement is with Backbone. So here's our first example that uses Angular. So Angular says, all right, uh, it's going to be as simple as possible, and it will assume that the developer wants a model. So you don't need to write any code to create the model. The, uh, there's a model there by default in Angular. So the things that have changed are this ng app has been added to the HTML tag. So this is an Angular directive. Angular directives are probably the most powerful concept in Angular. They, they pretty much expand the vocabulary of HTML, teaches HTML new tricks. Um, and you can create your own directives, but for a while we'll just work with the directives that have been provided so you can see what they're capable of. So ng app says to Angular, okay, this page is an Angular app. You should do whatever you need to do to make Angular work on this page. So it's called the bootstrapping process where it compiles the DOM. Here it's using um, CDNJS, which if you, don't, if you don't know about it, CDNJS is a CDN for mo like all popular JavaScript libraries. CDN stands for Content Distribution Network. It means that you can just include this URL in the source attribute of the script tag and it will load from this hosted version of Angular. Um, you could also just say uh, source equals angular.js, but then you'd have to have it in that directory. So it's loading Angular, and then here in the body, it's, it's using the ng-model directive on the input element. So what this does, it tells Angular that this input the content of this input field should be bound to the name property on the Angular model, which is, I think, called the root scope of Angular. But it's, it's, it's like a backbone model where, where you can listen for changes and you can set, you can change it, and then th those changes will propagate. So this directive right here, it sets up Angular to be listening for this, for changes here and then setting the new text to be the name property on the Angular model. And then these handlebars, this, this handlebar syntax tells Angular, use the value from name on the model to update this template. 
and Angular automatically updates the template when name changes. So this is called data binding. The data, being name, is bound to the input, which is the you know, user interface element, and also the, the template. So here when I type uh, Jim, you know, it updates there. Question? Yeah, uh, so you don't have to do any, um, like, definition? Yeah, the question is you don't need to declare the properties of the model beforehand. You can just start using them. And that's right. That's right. In, in Angular, they've, they tried to minimize the boilerplate. And so they saw that, I guess, as an opportunity to just, you know, automatically detect it and, and make the changes like that. Yeah, so you don't need to declare name beforehand. It will make it if it's not there. So in the next example, I just made multiple input fields and bound them to the same model. So you can see if I type Jim here, it updates in all three of them. So this is like multi-way data binding. And if you can imagine doing this with jQuery directly would be a real pain because you'd have to think about all pairs of this. Doing it with Backbone would be better because you, you could separate it to the model. Um, but Angular, it's, it's just very clean like this. So here's an example with two properties on the model, first name and last name. So like Joe Schmo. So this just demonstrates you can have multiple properties on the model and the template will update when either one of them changes. So Angular internally deals with the logic of when do I change this? You know. So here we're introducing the concept of an Angular controller. So far it's all been in the HTML, but you can access the Angular model in JavaScript through controllers. So here we have a global function declared called name CTRL. Uh, the CTRL thing is a just an Angular convention. It could be named anything, but this is the Angular convention. Name your controllers with CTRL at the end. And Angular gives you this object called dollar sign $scope. So this scope object is the model of Angular. They call it scope. It's just a plain JavaScript object in terms of the way you manipulate it. You don't need to call, like Backbone, you know, scope.set or scope.get. Um, and this is one thing that differentiates Angular from other data binding frameworks. Most of the other data binding frameworks use some kind of thing like a backbone model where you need to call a function to set or get values, but Angular had this decision um, to just make it simple and use a plain JavaScript object with properties. So the way Angular knows how which function you use as a controller is in the body tag, I've added this directive ng-controller name ctrl. So this tells Angular, use this function as the controller for this portion of the HTML page. And different portions of the page could have different controllers. You know, you don't have to put it on the body. You could put it on some inside element like a div. So everything else is the same as it was before, but now it's bound to this controller. So you see this controller initialized the data to John Smith, and, that, and when you load it, it says John Smith. But still, if I change it, it updates. So this is the basic concept of an Angular controller. This example just uses a global function as the controller, and Angular looks for that if there's nothing else. But this pollutes the global namespace, which is not good for complex apps as things get more and more complex. So this is how you can do it you know, the Angular way and not pollute the global namespace. You call angular.module name app. So notice here, there's an ng app, app equals name app. So this tells Angular for this app, use the module called name app. And you could have multiple ng apps on a page also. The ng app doesn't have to be on the root element, it could be on a sub element. Uh, so you could have multiple apps running on the same page that have totally independent uh, 
scopes and everything. We declare the Angular module. The first argument is the name, and the second argument is the list of dependencies. So right now, it's, it doesn't have any dependencies. And we'll see how the dependencies work a little later. To define a controller within this module, you call name app dot controller. So instead of de declaring a global function, you, you use this API. So the first argument is the name of the controller, and the second argument is the function that, that implements it, which hasn't changed from last time. So still everything, it does the same thing, but now we're not polluting the global namespace as much. I mean, we're adding this name app, but this could be wrapped in an immediately invoked function, so so then you wouldn't pull it the global namespace. So when people come to Angular, a lot of the questions are like, well, how does Angular know when, you, when you've changed a property on the scope? Because if you just set it, you know, how does Angular know? With Backbone, it's clear. You, you call set, and then inside the implementation of set, Backbone can say, all right, I'll propagate this to all the things that are listening for changes when you call set. But if you just set the property of the object, how does Angular know? So I've written a little test. So here's a, it says set timeout, which just executes this function one second later after the fact. So it, wait for one second and then say scope.lastname equals Smith. And notice how it, it hasn't updated. There's no last name there. So it didn't work. So it's like, oh, how do I do this? Um, in addition, I want to introduce scope.watch. Scope.watch is a function you can use. It's kind of like backbone.on, where you can listen for changes on a particular property of the model. So this will call this function when last name changes. So if I open up the console, let me clear it. When you call watch, this function is called immediately with the current value. Of, the, of that property. So it's the current value is undefined. So how do you tell Angular that things have changed? Well, the next example just calls scope dot dollar sign apply. So in Angular, there's the concept of like, the, the creator, Mishko Hevery, talks about this like being inside Angular or outside Angular. Uh, if you're inside Angular, you're inside some function that is like managed by Angular and then after that function executes it calls scope.apply or scope.digest something like that where it tells Angular all right look for changes just see if anything changed and if anything changed propagate just those changes but since I've called set timeout now this asynchronous thing is outside the Angular world, right? So Angular doesn't know that this is going on. I think Angular has a version of set timeout that does know, uh, but I just wanted to demonstrate. So scope.apply is how you propagate changes through Angular from asynchronous events that don't, that are not managed by Angular. And scope.watch is how you get, so out, this is how you get out of the Angular world, it's how you get the updates. So if you need to run some custom JavaScript in response to changes on the model, this is how you do it. Here's an example where instead of just a single value, we're setting an array. So scope.names is this list of names now. And then in the body, we have a ULLI thing, which is an ordered list, a bulleted list. We're using the ng repeat directive here, which says it's basically a for each, for each name in names. And when it resolves names, it knows to look at this scope because it's bound to this controller. Um, so for each name, just output the name. This, out, this outputs one li element per name. So this is the, the resulting thing. So if I run this full screen, I can inspect the DOM here. And you can see that, sure enough, Angular has put three LI elements in here. And it added some extra stuff to deal with, you know, to, to make Angular magic work. 
So this is how you use the ng repeat directive. And by the way, a lot of this comes from the Angular tutorial. So if you go to the Angular website and you go to learn tutorial, Angular has this great tutorial here. Um, here's basically a copy of that example I showed you where it, it shows you many phones. So in this example, I've added a text input and then an add button. Now if I click add, it adds it to that list. So here's how that works. I've defined an add name function on the scope. So, so far we've just assigned data values to the scope, but you can also assign functions. And then you can access those functions inside of these angular expressions, they're called. So here's the add name function. What it does is it, it pushes a new element onto the names array on scope, and it, use, it uses scope.entered name. So in this form here, it gets entered name because this text input is bound to the entered name property of the model. So as I'm, as I'm changing this text, entered name is being changed. And then, so here's the add button. And then the way that you hook in forms to Angular, so normally if I hit add, it would try to refresh the page or something. But if you add this Angular directive, ng submit, it says, instead of actually submitting the form and refreshing the page, stay on this page and just call this function, add name. And this function is on the current scope. So when I type add, it calls add name, which executes this. It gets entered name out of the scope, and it pushes it to the names array. And since this function is executing in response to this ng submit, it's, you know, quote, inside the Angular world. So Angular automatically will call scope.apply, and you don't need to call that. So that's how it detects these updates. So if I add, like, Jim, it adds Jim to the end of the list and Harry also. So notice one thing in this example. I type um, Jim, I hit enter, add, but Jim is still there in the text box. But in terms of the user interface, like I want, I want to remove that after I enter it because it's been entered, you know, it's not going to be entered again. So it's frustrating if I'm using this. Like I type John, hit enter, John is still there. So, how do you think I can get rid of that text in the input field? Yeah, so I could change the model. So the thing that's responsible for this is entered name, right? This text input is bound to entered name. So yeah, that's a perfect idea. Right here, I could just say scope.entered name equals an empty string. So that's what the next example does. It says scope.entered name equals empty string. So now if I type Jim and hit enter, now that gets cleared. So you can see this is the beauty of data binding. It simplifies a lot of different things when you're developing a web application. I want something to change? Okay, just change the model, and the data binding will take care of updating the view in response to the model. Let's say we want to be able to remove things from this list also. If I click remove, it will remove that guy. So how does this work? Well, here's a function added to the scope called remove name. You give it the name, and this is just some JavaScript that deals with arrays. It gets the index of that name in the array. So if, if name is curly, it'll return 1, because the indices are 0, 1, 2. So I would be 1, and then it calls splice, which is just a, a JavaScript array function that will remove the element at that index. So it, will, it removes one element starting at index i, and it, it changes that value. So this function just removes it from the array on the model. And how can we integrate that into the user interface? 
So in this ng repeat, um, oh, this should be formatted differently, like this. So for each name, inside the li element, add a link. A href equals empty string. The purpose of that href thing is just to make this thing look like a link. It looks like something you can click on. And then ng click is a directive that you can execute an Angular expression when you click on that thing. So when I click on the remove link here to the right, it just calls remove name name. And name is in the scope now. See, this is a nested scope within ng repeat. So name is, is now bound to that particular name like on that entry. So if I click remove, it removes just that person. So now I can add and remove people from this list. And by the way, I want to take a little aside and talk about Angular expressions. So in Angular, Angular expressions pop up all over the place. Uh, inside an ng repeat, this is an Angular expression. And inside this ng click, this is also an Angular expression. And in the templates also, this is an Angular expression. So if I had an object, say person, I could say person.name. And there's a lot of other syntax that does cool things inside of Angular expressions. And I just wanted to point out that it's a JavaScript-like thing, but it's actually an Angular language uh, that hooks in with the Angular concept of scope and stuff like that. So this Angular expression documentation is really nice, really clear. Just wanted to let you know. So in these examples, I have links. So you see also ng controller. The Angular documentation is really, really good. This is what it looks like. It's beautiful. And for each version, they have a separate version of the documentation. So in this ng controller, and they have examples too in, in each of these docs. Um, so this is, for example, where I got the idea. This is the original example I used to learn how to remove things. So here you can click clear and X removes it from the list. This is, a, this is a more complicated example, but just wanted to let you know that's where it came from. So here I've changed things just slightly to be a separate kind of thing. This is a listing of countries in the world. So it says scope.countries equals this array of basically JSON data that says the name of the country, China, population, some number for the three largest countries on earth, China, India, and the United States. So this is an example of using objects instead of strings in this array that you use with ng repeat. So here, ng repeat says, you know, for each country <coughs> in countries, country dot name. So the reason I can use dot is because it's an angular expression. And dot will give me that sub property inside the object. So this is the outer object, country, and then name will give, give me, say, China. And then a dash, you know, population is country.population. So this is what, what renders in the output. So this is an example of using objects in arrays with ng repeat. So here I'm just changing the ULLI thing to be a table. So here's how you can use ng repeat to make a table. So here's an HTML table. TR, TH is the header. So it says country population. That's from this code here, which is the heading. And I'm repeating on the TR element and making TDs for each uh, column of each row. So this element will make this thing in the table, and this element will make this thing in the table. Here the JSON data is, is right in the code. It's right there. But often uh, the data resides on a server, and you want to fetch it from a server. 
or even query a database. And based on your query, the data returned will be different. So here's how you can fetch JSON data using HTTP. So in my controller, function scope comma dollar sign HTTP. So this is Angular's dependency injection mechanism at work. So notice how the only thing that changed is the function signature. It now has dollar sign HTTP. And magically, Angular gives you the HTTP module. So here are the docs on HTTP. It's really nice. It's like a, it's a wrapper for X, XML HTTP request, which, is, um, which fetches data from remote resources. This is the basis of AJAX. You can salt call dot success or dot error. Um, so Angular provides this for you. So Angular inspects the signature of the function, looks for these things. So because you get you put it scope, dollar sign scope, using this Angular convention of dollar sign something, Angular will inject that resource for you. So it's injected the HTTP module, and it's http.get countries.json. And countries.json is here, is listed here. It's just a file, a text file that has the JSON data in it. But it has a lot more data than we had before. So give it the path called dot success. This is kind of the promises way of doing things. And give it a callback function where you get the data. So this data variable will be the JSON data. Um, it, this HTTP module automatically parses JSON data into an object. So you don't need to call json.parse on the string. So then we can just say scope.countries equals data. So just like before, here's the previous example, scope.countries equals this array. Now scope.countries equals the data from the file. And so check out the table now, it's huge. It's got all these entries for all the countries of the world and their populations. So Angular has various ways to express your dependencies with their dependency injection mechanism. One way is, like we said, like, like we had before, put, just put it in the function signature. But in production apps, uh, people usually do what's called minification, where you run the JavaScript through a minifier and it changes all the variable names. So then this won't work anymore. Angular won't be able to tell what the names are because they've been changed by the minifier. So to get around that, there's this alternative syntax for declaring your dependencies. So when I call countryapp.controller, instead of the second argument being a function, now the second argument is an array. And the first few things in the array are strings that say what modules are dependent upon. And then the second the, the last thing in the array is a function. And now these names could be anything. So I just removed the dollar sign um, just to show you that it could be anything. It could be B or A. Uh, all the other code is the same. So this is just something to be aware of. Anytime in Angular you see a function that takes a dollar sign something or other, it's likely using Angular's dependency injection mechanism. And in place of that function, you could also put an array. And this is robust. This this will still work after minification. What? Is there a way you can add classes and IDs for this? Classes and IDs? Yeah. yeah, so the question is, can you make IDs and classes on the things inside of Angular uh, repeat directive? So you can use templates inside of any part of the HTML, which is a beautiful thing. So let's say I wanted to add a class to the country names, or an ID. So I'm going to say ID equals quote country dot name. So see that you can you can put the template right inside of the ID. I mean the Angular expression. So this will give each of these TD elements an ID of the country name. And similarly, you can say class equals 
something. And you can evaluate this to anything. It could be anything in the model. And it could also be in the parent scope. You could say countries dot something. And that would work. So that's how you can add IDs and classes to things inside of an ng repeat. And Angular's dependency injection documentation is really nice. Um, I've talked about two ways of doing it, but there's also a third. This next example adds search functionality to this table. So let's say I wanted to, instead of looking at all the countries at once, I just want to look at, I want to look up the population for a certain country. So like, what's the population of China? So I can type China, C-H-I-N-A. Okay, there it is. So when I change the text here, it instantly filters that table to contain whatever I type. So how does the code do that? Well, I've added a text box right here. It says input ng model equals query. So this is just the same before, same as before. It just updates the query property on the model when you change it. And the only thing that's changed is ng repeat country in countries pipe, the pipe character, filter colon query. So for Angular filters, filter, colon, array, expression, comparator, and so on, and it has some examples. It takes a string and it filters down the content based on uh, this like fuzzy string matching thing, where any, if any part of the string matches that thing, it will include it. So for each country, it checks both fields, actually. Um, and this is all you need to do to implement this functionality. It's pretty uh, amazing. See, it also keys on the population, which is pretty cool. So this is an example that uses Angular filters. Here's, here's an example where the result is, is sorted by population. So if, if I want to see all the country names that have united in them, sorted by, pop, by population, here it is. So now it's sorted by increasing population. And the way that's done is the only change I made from last time is I added this little piece, pipe order by population. So this is a really nice syntax for sorting within an ng repeat element. So, but let's say I wanted to invert the order here. I wanted to sort it by decreasing population. So here's this next example. It's sorting in decreasing order. And all you need to do to change that is add a minus sign before the property name there. Does the order matter in the pipes? Does the order matter with the pipes? Like yeah, I think it does. I think it does. Like if I were to, for example, swap these, I think, I'm not 100% sure, but I think for each country it will get that array and then it will sort that whole array. It'll do that computation to sort the whole array and then after the sorting it will do the filtering. So the other way is actually more efficient. First filter the array down and then sort only on the filtered result. Yeah, I think they've designed it so that the, it's just like Unix pipes, where it executes in the order you give it. Yeah. So let's say I want to sort, sort these table columns interactively. Like when I click on a column, it should sort by that particular thing. So here I've done it. You can click on country and it sorts by country name. And you can click on population and it sorts by increasing population. So how's that done? There's now a sort field property on the scope. And in the order by statement, it's not quoted anymore. And because it's not quoted, it will look for a sort field property on the model. So now it will order by whatever this sort field is on the model. So it's initialized to population. And then so at first it will sort by population. And then in the table header, I've added the, this href equals empty string to make it look like a link so you can click on it. And then ng click, which is the click handler directive for Angular, it 
executes this angular expression. So in angular expressions, you can also assign to values on the scope. So it says, when I click the country header, it will assign sort field to be name. And since this is inside the Angular world, Angular will detect these changes and then propagate it to whatever is bound to that part of the model, which is this order by filter. So Angular automatically detects that the sort field has changed and then it re-renders this portion of the page based on that new thing. So if I click country, it sorts by country, and then by population, it sorts by population. But let's say we wanted this to be like a sortable table, where if I click population again, it will sort the other way, you know, by population going down. Well, how might you do this? Uh, here's an, this next example does it. When I click population multiple times, it sorts by the, inverting, the inverted order. Notice in the uh, Angular order by documentation, you can give it order by expression colon reverse. And reverse is a Boolean that will reverse the order of the array. So rather than putting a minus sign before the field, you can pass this additional argument of reverse. I've added a reverse field to the model and then added that into the filter here. So it's ordering by the sort field, but it's reversing if the reverse property on the model is true, and it's not if it's false. And then in the ng click uh, handler for the click event, it says sort field equals name or population just like before, but then it's added, I added this code, reverse equals not reverse. So this will toggle that boolean. So if it's true, if it was true before, it will be false after this. And if it was false before, it will be true after this. So it'll just switch it. So this has the effect of, if I click on country once, it sorts starting at A. And if I click on it again, it's sort of starting on Z. And, and so on. If I click, it reverses. And you can click on population and sort it like that also. And the search functionality is still there. Nothing changed. So you can use all these things at the same time, too, which is a beautiful aspect of Angular filters. So that's how you can build a sortable table and searchable with Angular. I looked up the flag URLs in Wikipedia on the Wikipedia pages. So on the Wikipedia page for China, for example, there's this flag. And if I click on the flag, you see it's just this SVG file that's available at this particular URL. So, in the data, I've added this flag URL property to each country entry. So now each country has a name, population, and a flag URL. And inside of the table header, I've added a flag column right here. And inside the repeater, I've added an image where the source of the image is that flag URL. So you can put these handlebars things in anywhere inside the HTML, pretty much, including inside quoted things like the source attribute. And then set the width to be 100 because by default they're huge flags. There's like 500 pixels or something. So here's the effect. The flag is there. but. Look at this. If I run this page full screen, I look at the console, it says, oh, failed to load some resource. Like, what's going on? If I refresh the page, it, it tries to look up these things that are not there. So what is this? If I click on this, this is the URL. Countryflag.url. Hmm. So what's happening is, when I first load the page, before the JSON data has loaded, it evaluates this source image attribute as the template, which is terrible. So it's trying to fetch the template, you know, country.flag in the beginning. So this is not good, right? I mean, it works basically, but it gives this error in the beginning. So the way you can avoid that is 
you can use the ng-source directive. And uh, what that does is, is a particular directive that only sets the source after the model has been loaded, you know, after the template evaluates. So if I run this example full screen, you can see, okay, now there's no network errors. It's not trying to do that anymore. So that's how you use ng-source uh, for dynamic source attributes of elements. And it could be anything. It doesn't have to be an image. ng-source could be on anything that has a source attribute, like an iframe, something like that. So now I've added a capital. In the data, each country has a capital now. And it's very straightforward to make this change. Just add the country.capital to the template. And here's also GDP, gross domestic product, has been added. So the header links to the, H the Wikipedia page for GDP in case you don't know what it is. So I'm just demonstrating you can add multiple uh, properties very easily. Once you get the basic template set up, it's easy to add more, more data to it. Let's say we wanted to format this as currency, because I think it's in US dollars. So what if you wanted to add like commas and the dollar sign and stuff like that? Well, here's a, here's a version that does it. And the, the way it works is country.gdp, which is just from the data, it's a number, pipe currency. So here, the angular filters are being used inside of the template. So this just reiterates, you know, this is an angular expression. Uh, the repeater, this is an angular expression. And you can put filters in any angular expression. And currency is a built-in one. Here's the angular docs on the built-in currency filter. Uh, here's how you use it. And by the way, if you click here, Th these are all the built-in filters in Angular. There are lots of them. Uppercase, date, uh, format a number as text. So if it formats a big number with commas, for example, like this. So all I did to make this format like currency was add this filter, GDP filter uh, currency. And so let's say I wanted to add commas to the population entries. Um, here it is, it works. Um, it's just country.population filter, you know, using the number filter, which adds the commas. So this is a demonstration of how powerful these Angular filters can be. There's a fundamental part of single page apps, which is routing. Routing will respond to the URL and change the content of the page based on the URL. So in preparation for routing, let's simplify the page so this code is simplified. It's just like one of the previous examples. It loads JSON, makes a list. That's all. So now let's get started with routing in Angular. To get routing set up, you need to make a lot of changes. This loads the Angular route. So in our app module, we declare as a dependency ng route. So the ng route module was defined in this script. And here we're just declaring our app depends on that thing. So this is an instance of Angular's dependency injection at work. So here is the API for routing in Angular. CountryApp.config, which initializes the module. This gets called once. Function uh, route provider. Again, this is using dependency injection by inference. It infers it based on the arguments of the function. So route provider, uh, you can see the route provider documentation is really nice. It says, how can you use this API? Um, for e You say win, give it a path and a route, and it's nice documentation. So win slash. So this means when the URL ends in hash slash. So keep in mind, all of this is after the hash symbol, because the page never refreshes. So at the root of it, it uses this template and this controller. So the templates are just strings here. It's the same template I had before. It's an UL LI with an NG repeat. It's just a list with all the country names. And it uses 
country list contr controller, which is defined here. It's the same thing as before. It just gets the JSON data and sets it on the scope. And here's a new thing. When it's hash symbol slash and then some string, uh, the colon here says that this is like a variable in the path. And this variable will be evaluated uh, based on whatever string it is. So if I type hash slash uh, Africa, this country name will evaluate to the string Africa. So here's the template. It's just a, uh, a placeholder template for now. And then it uses this other controller. So each route has its own controller that deals with each uh, view separately. So here's that controller, country detail controller. With, the, with Angular's dependency injection, it requests the scope and this route params thing. So the route params gives you whatever is inside of this route evaluated as like a variable. So here it's just outputting the route params. So let's see what this looks like. If I run this in a separate tab, um, what has output to the console? Nothing. Because the route hasn't changed. But if I type in the, in the URL here, slash China, and hit enter, the page doesn't refresh. But then I output this thing, object, country name, China. So this is, this is the route params object, what you get. It's just a key value mapping with all of the parameters from the route. So here, China is the country name. Country name gets mapped to China when you evaluate this route. So this is the basic structure of how to add routing to the app. And notice how when I go there, it just prints out that. It doesn't really... Oh, and it says... It goes to this other view. It says to do create country detail view. This is the template over here, the template for this controller. And then if I go back to just slash, it should give me the list of countries. Oh, there it is. Yeah, it gives you the list of countries. Question? Can you use whole files? Yeah. So the question is can the templates be in separate files? Yes. So in the next example, it, it shows you how to move the templates out into separate files. So instead of using the template property on this particular route, you use template URL, which, which will cause Angular to fetch that HTML content when you navigate to that uh, page. So here are the different files. Now country detail view is this. Country list is this. Everything is the same as it was before. Here's how you can use the country name. So here I've changed the country detail view to just put the name there. And here it assigns scope.name equals route param params.country name. It gets the country name out of that URL. So let's see what it looks like. Um, If I navigate to China, hit enter, now it says China right there. This is, I guess, as far as I'm going to get today, but it gives you a sense of Angular. This is the introduction to Angular. Um, are there any questions? Yeah? Does Angular work well with other libraries like 3.js or OpenGL? Well, you can definitely use them in conjunction. Like if, it, if, if there's an app that has different pages for different kinds of things, and inside the page there's an OpenGL widget thing, definitely you can add it. And um, you, you can actually make your own Angular directive to be some kind of 3D widget with dynamic content. So that's how they could integrate. Yep. <coughs> So thank you very much. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you.